Chapter 252, Ancient Times. Lumion's fireball missed its target, Charlotte, and in response, countless branches and vines slithered into Albert's de Coq from every direction, entwining the walls, floor, windows, and ceiling. They twisted together in a tangle of brown and green, creating an impenetrable barrier. In an instant, the entire scene transformed into a surreal illusion before solidifying once more. Before him stood an immense tree, its shades of brown and green blending together harmoniously. Its roots delved deep into the earth, while its majestic crown reached ever higher towards the heavens. Lumian's eyes widened as he realized he had been unknowingly transported. It was reminiscent of his previous journeys into Paramita, where he would find himself in a new place without any awareness of the transition. Gone was Alberge du Coq Now, his feet trod upon the tangled knots of tree roots that carpeted the ground. His gaze ascended to the colossal tree, reminiscent of ancient legends, as the vast expanse of the sky, with its painted-like blue hue and fluffy white clouds, loomed above. The tree's surface was marred by repulsive, damp growths, and each branch appeared to bear the weight of a structure, a building, a road, and other peculiarities. Albert du Coq was among them, perched upon a brownish-green tree trunk, intertwined with countless branches and vines, revealing a mere dozen windows to the world. Through one of the glass windows, Lumian caught sight of the eloping couple engaged in passionate lovemaking, while the information broker, Anthony Reed, cowered under a wooden table, trembling in fear. The other tree trunks held objects enshrouded by branches, leaves, and vines, appearing ethereal and hazy, as if they were scenes recorded by a magnetic field through foggy air. Within this realm, ancient buildings with pediments, herringbone roofs, and lead-framed windows emerged. Women clutching gas street lamps were embraced from behind. Priests stood before nude men, and individuals slipped out of glass windows while covering their behinds. Exquisite bodies were carried on trays to dining tables. Orgies unfolded with clothing strewn about, and an evil beauty turned her head to reveal two black goat horns. A bishop naked from the bottom half heard confessions from believers in front of a sacred emblem. The scenes varied in architectural styles, clothing, and hairstyles, some evoking ancient times while others seemed to have occurred just yesterday. Behind Lumion, crimson fire ravens materialized, half illusory. He swiftly scanned the area, yet Franca was nowhere to be found. Franca hadn't been transported to this place caught between reality and illusion. On Rue Anarchy, amidst the tree roots, branches, and vines, street vendors and pedestrians devoured the food they sold. Even after vomiting, they continued to eat with unwavering determination. Some forcefully pinned down members of the opposite sex on the street, others drawing daggers to attack peers who had provoked them or dared steal their spots. In scenes of utter chaos, certain individuals approached glass windows, attempting to entice their reflections into a dance with a gentlemanly bow. Pedestrians and carriages traversed the streets, seemingly oblivious to the extraordinary circumstances. Vendors continued their lively hawking, and shops remained open. Passerby appeared captivated by the bustling atmosphere, unwilling to depart. What they failed to notice was the absence of anyone who had entered this area. They had simply vanished, never to return. On the fourth floor of the khaki-colored building that housed the Member of Parliament's office at Avenue du Marché, Hugh Zartoy, lost in thought, gazed out at the nearby streets. Cassandra, with her fiery red hair, turned back to him and asked with curiosity, What is Susanna from the Bliss Society planning? A smile formed on Hugh Zartoy's lips as he replied. They spoke a great deal, but my understanding was limited. I recall them mentioning a plan to submerge the underground divine tree into the depths of 4th Epoch Treyar and extend it into a place called the Astral World. Cassandra, Roan, Margaret, and Boduva exchanged puzzled and concerned glances, unable to hide their confusion. But won't that cause a tremendous uproar? Our current strength is far from that of official beyonders. It's best to avoid a direct clash with them. You might not be aware, but I come from the Sauron family and I understand the authorities quite well. I know how powerful and formidable they can be. Everything we've done so far has been in secret, evading investigations as best we could. If we were to be exposed, it's highly likely that we would face a saint or a grade one sealed artifact, and beyond them, there are angels and grade zero sealed artifacts. 
Hugh Zartoy pressed his right hand down and reassured them with a smile. Fear not. They won't implicate us. I didn't incite them to undertake this endeavor. I didn't even offer a hint or assistance. I can only be considered aware of their plan in advance, silently consenting to their actions. The only thing that could potentially link us to this affair is the explosion at the chemical plants that received an excessive amount of decay blessings. However, that occurred because Bono Goodville misunderstood Roan's intentions and committed an unforgivable crime. The various emotions and desires stemming from the accident were exploited, amplified, and used as nourishment. What does that have to do with us? As the team members' expressions eased, Hugh Sartois stepped away from the window, emitting a deep chuckle. If they succeed, it will mark another solid step forward in our pursuits. We will be even closer to welcoming the descent of great existences. If they, unfortunately, fail, we will exercise restraint for the time being and strive to ensure that our activities remain hidden from the beyonders of the two churches. We will continue to be the rulers of the market district. Success or failure, it's our opportunity. During the National Convention's discussions, I will expose the corruption and mediocre abilities of the Beyonders from the two churches. They have allowed heretics to repeatedly ravish the market district, each time worse than the last. I will request Bureau 8 to establish a branch in the market district to assist the inept church Beyonders and share their burden. Bureau 8, always eager to expand its authority, will surely support my proposal. With three different official forces simultaneously present in the market district, conflicts among them will work to our advantage. Compared to the orthodox beyonders of the two churches, Bureau 8 can be influenced, corrupted, and gradually swayed to our side. This is my plan. In the long run, victory will be ours. Roan, the secretary with gold-rimmed glasses and neatly combed hair, chuckled. That's my specialty. Influencing corrupting, and gradually decaying an organization, leading to its decline in moral degradation. Hugh Zartoy adjusted his tailcoat and bow tie, preparing to leave for the banquet hall. Before departing, he surveyed his surroundings, his gaze shifting between Cassandra, Roan, Boduva, and Margaret. An unusual sense of confidence and certainty washed over him. These four subordinates possessed impressive beyond her powers, with the red-haired Cassandra being particularly formidable instilling him with a sense of security. Outside the office door, near the stairs, stood an official beyond team tasked with protecting him. Not every member of parliament received the privilege of a companion to ensure their safety. It was only someone like Hugh Zartoy, lacking beyond her abilities and familial support, who required three-man protective team. Some were already powerful beyonders, while others hailed from noble backgrounds and had their own beyonder bodyguards. For some, a certain level of personal strength warranted the presence of a Beyonder companion to ensure their safety. It was only someone like Hugh Zartoy, lacking Beyonder abilities and familial support, who required such protection. According to the rules, the responsibility of safeguarding Hugh Zartoy rotated among the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, the God of Steam and Machinery Church, and Bureau 8. Today, it was the turn of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church. In addition to the Beyonders, the entire building housed ten well-trained professional security guards armed with firearms. They were members of Bureau 7, a branch of the Intus Intelligence and Homeland Security Committee, the Secret Services Bureau, responsible for providing basic protection to members of Parliament and high-ranking government officials. Standing by the door, Hughes Artoy awaited Roan, his secretary, to open it. With a smile on his face, he lifted his head slightly puffed out his chest, and confidently walked out, descending the stairs. On the ground covered with tangled tree roots, Lumion surrounded himself with semi-illusory fire ravens, once again spotting Charlotte Covino, the leading lady of Theatre de Lanza and Keja Pigeons. With a remarkable talent for acting, Charlotte gracefully wandered through the illusory scenes formed by the various tree trunks. Sometimes, she adorned a corset dress and styled her hair in an elegant bun, other times, she embraced contemporary fashion, donning a fitted dress, a small coat, and long boots. On certain occasions, she even transported herself to the era of the Sauron royal family, embodying their love for masculine attire and blending seamlessly with the corresponding backdrop. In this ethereal process, whenever she left one misty illusory scene, she promptly emerged in another, 
as if leisurely strolling through different eras of Treyar. Beneath the dim glow of the gas street lamps, Charlotte wore a smile as she addressed Lumion. You should consider yourself honored. You are the first dissident to enter the divine tree and merge with it. The crimson fire ravens encircling Lumion condensed, but refrained from attacking. This was because Charlotte constantly flickered between illusory scenes, altering her appearance with each transition. Her voice echoed from all directions, forming sentences. Lumion had already donned black gloves. His right hand was in his pocket, gripping Mr. K's finger tightly. Charlotte continued her discourse, introducing the situation as if through an aria, as if it were insufficient to satisfy her inner desires. This ancient tree of shadow predates the construction of present-day Treyar. Its roots were buried deep underground. It brings delight and sustenance to the people of Treyar. With the aid of the devil lineage and devoted followers, the ambiance here gradually transformed according to the deity's desired path. The people of Treyar have never failed it. Both debauchery and pleasure are inherent to human nature. Year after year, they showered it with various excessive desires, providing it with nourishment. Over a millennium has elapsed, Although Treyar hasn't reached the expected pinnacle of unbridled joy and indulgence until death, it has taken form. The divine tree's growth has now reached a crucial crossroads. In such a situation, pure desires and emotions can no longer play their primary role. They can only serve as firewood for the fire. We require a sacrifice of considerable magnitude. And you, who possess corruption at the angelic level, but lack commensurate strength, are the perfect choice. Lumion's heart skipped a beat upon hearing this, his pupils dilated, as if he wished to see Charlotte's face clearly. Does she know that I carry the sealed power of inevitability within me? Charlotte grinned. The first time you summoned High Priestess Susanna, she sensed the terrifying angelic power sealed within you. She didn't dare possess you. Her subsequent attempts to kill you were not solely motivated by Charlie.